everyone, my name is Susie Lytle. I'm an interpretive naturalist with the Forest Preserve District of Will County. And on this episode of The Buzz, we're gonna peek in on the bats at Hamill Woods. We're gonna see the prairie plants growing at Hadley Valley Preserve. We're gonna take a moment of zen to get a little calm. And then we'll end with the crazy hummingbirds at Plum Creek Nature Center. So let's reconnect with nature on this episode of The Buzz. <music> Welcome to Hamill Woods. You can see behind me is a beautiful old shelter. Little secret, there are tons of bats inside. And this is not the only place in the forest preserves that have bats. Lawton Preserve and Riverview Farmstead are two places that bats have adapted to find nooks and crannies to make their perfect little homes. There's 12 species of bats in Illinois, and there's six species in Will County. This shelter is home to the big brown bat. The big brown bat can fly 40 miles per hour and can turn on a dime. We wanted to catch the action for ourselves, so we packed our bags and came here at night. We turned on our lights and our cameras and watched the action unfold. We could feel the wind brush by us as those bats were flying around catching all the insects. So if you see a bat flying kind of all crazy, it's not that they can't see, it's that they're tracking that insect. So if you picture how an insect flies, it's kind of all over the place. So they're flying, tracking, clicking, and then they'll eat it. You may hear that the phrase, you're blind as a bat. Well, that's actually a myth. Bats can see as well as humans. But the cool part is that they have an added superpower of echolocation. So echolocation is like the sonar that they make chirps that bounce off of objects. Now the calls and how often they call depend on what they're doing. Either they're flying, they're trying to track prey, or they're chasing the prey. As they get closer to that insect, the calls become faster. And then snap. Let's talk about the benefits of bats. We know bats eat mosquitoes, but how many mosquitoes do they really eat? A little brown bat can eat 1,000 to 3,000 mosquitoes in one night. That is pretty amazing. The other bats eat beetles, grasshoppers, moths. That's important because a lot of times those can be considered pests. So 150 bats can eat 1.3 million of these pest insects a year. Another study proved that this prevents 33 million beetle larvae from ever being born. So that's a lot of larvae not chomping on our crops. Research has shown that this saves farmers billions of dollars to protect their crops and not use it on pesticides. And globally, bats have a huge impact as well. They can pollinate 300 to 500 plants. So tell me this, do you like bananas, avocados, mangoes, and my favorite, chocolate? We have bats to thank for that. They also do their part in reseeding the rainforest. So when they eat these fruits, they fly over, poop out the seeds, and new plants can grow. All right, where there are bats, there's also poop. The scientific name for bat poop is guano. You may think like, oh, guano, but it has some great benefits. It sparkles, it explodes, and it fertilizes. Now stay with me. It's supposed to sparkle because we talked about what bats eat. They're eating those crunchy insects. Think of beetles that have the hard exoskeletons. Sometimes those are shiny. So if the bat eats it, then poops it out, sometimes there'll be little shiny pieces in their guano. It explodes. Historically, in the American Civil War, they ran out of resources to make gunpowder. But bat guano has the perfect nutrients inside to make a good substitute. And then it fertilizes. It also has nitrates, phosphorus, potassium, all these great things that help your plants grow. They make greener grass, stronger roots, and sturdier stems. So by getting bats into your yard, this guano, it makes your plants healthy and strong. So remember, when you're visiting our forest preserves and you're checking out these bats for yourself, remember they're hanging up high and we talked about their poop and they could also pee on you. So watch your head. Now these roosts, we're really looking at moms and the babies, so just the females, the males, roosts, and other places. The females can have about one pup a year and they all take care of each other. 
You'll notice on those bat wings, they have little claws. That's where their thumb would be. So these little claws help them cling and crawl on the surfaces when needed. Bats are nocturnal mammals, and they're the only mammal that are true flyers. I know, I know, you're gonna say, what about flying squirrels? Well, flying squirrels technically glide from branch to branch, not fly. These bats can fly, and they do it in an interesting way. If you think about a bird flying, you see them taking off with like a leap, or they do a running start. These bats hang upside down. So they don't have strong leg muscles, but by hanging upside down, they can drop, open up their wings, and then take off. Here is a bat condo that we built in 2014 with the hopes that those shelter bats would want to move into this. Unfortunately, they didn't decide to go anywhere, but this is a great place for maybe a new colony to come. It can house 1,600 bats. That's pretty awesome. Do you want one of these in your backyard? Well, if you can't build something so elaborate, think of a small bat box. Those can be installed on the side of your house, welcoming about 100 bats and their great benefits to be your new neighbors. So let's take a break and have a little shameless plug for our own Moni Reservoir. This summer, make it your mission to check out Moni Reservoir. It's a perfect staycation destination. The scenery is breathtaking and this is a great fishing spot. Largemouth bass, channel catfish, bluegill and crappie are what you can expect to reel in here. Catch and release is encouraged. Visit the concession stand to buy some bait, rent a boat, then venture out on your own to explore all parts of the reservoir and find that perfect place to reel in some fish. Rent a canoe or kayak, or if you have your own, bring it and buy a launch pass. You're sure to have a great time on the water. Your health and safety is a high priority, and each rented piece of equipment is sanitized before it goes out again. So go ahead, pay us a visit and soak up the peace and serenity of nature close to home. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org. Let's get back on land and head over to Hadley Valley Preserve to see what plants are growing in the prairie. At one time, we had 22 million acres of prairie. Now we only have 0.01% left of that remaining in our state. So it's so important to keep these prairies healthy and protected. Hadley Valley Preserve is a great example of how the Forest Preserve teamed up with other organizations to restore this land to its former greatness. 500 acres were worked on to de-channelize the stream using aerial photographs from the 1940s. We also restored the wetland and wildlife habitats by planting 150,000 wetland plants and planting seven tons of prairie seeds. Hadley Valley Preserve is an excellent example of how the Forest Preserve has restored this natural area. We've worked with a handful of partners and actually won awards recognizing all this hard work. Illinois is nicknamed the Prairie State, so let's take some time to celebrate all that the prairie has to offer. What is a prairie? It's a habitat made up of grasses, forbs, with a very few trees. Forbs are the wildflowers that bloom in between the grasses. Another really important part of the prairies is fire. So naturally, in the past, fires would naturally be here. It would be burning down the stems, returning all the nutrients right into the soil. So we don't have too many natural fires. The forest preserve is here to set prescribed burns to make sure this prairie gets everything it needs. Let me introduce you to Illinois' state grass, Big Blue Stem, also called turkey foot. It's called turkey foot because of these seed heads. Spread them out, one, two, three, 
looks like a turkey's foot. <laughs> this plant can grow eight feet tall and is one of the most dominant plants in a tall grass prairie. It's been named the king of native grasses for this reason. A big blue stem is so beneficial for all of our wildlife here in the prairie. Uh, skipper caterpillars, which are part of the Lepidotra, stay with me, Lepidotra has moths, butterflies, and skippers. These skipper caterpillars eat this big blue stem. Other animals like grasshoppers, katydids, leafhoppers depend on this for their food as well. Plus, we're going to the birds. Field sparrows, tree sparrows, chipping sparrows like the seeds. And let's not forget about the mammals. As small as voles to big bison eat this grass. This next plant goes by a lot of different names. Wild bergamot, bee balm, horse mint, oswego tea, monarda. I like to call it wild bergamot, but this is why common names and scientific names are something to think about. This plant is called Monarda fistulosa, and Monarda is named after the Spanish doctor and scientist that studied this plant for all the medical uses. Fistulosa is Latin for tubes or reeds. So if you look closely, you can see each one of these little flowers makes a tube, and this is what the pollinators have to go visit to get the nectar. So they'll go to each one circling about to get into those tubes. Wild bergamot's a great one to add to your garden if you want to see butterflies and bees and hummingbird moths love this plant. This beautiful plant is called Swamp Rose Mallow, aka a native hibiscus, which seems very tropical, but right here in Illinois we have our own hibiscus flower. This flower blooms from August to September, likes open sun and wet ground. It has its own bee that specializes, called a swamp rose mallow bee, <laughs> that gets in there, grabs the nectar and the pollen. But other bees like this, and it's a treat for the ruby-throated hummingbirds. This is one of my favorite flowers. It's called a false sunflower. So not quite the normal sunflower you used to, and it has something that's gonna blow your mind. So the difference between a false sunflower and a sunflower is what seeds. So if you think of a sunflower, that middle section is what gets pollinated and then the seeds. You've probably ate some of those seeds right out of that sunflower. These false sunflowers make seeds in the middle and around on their rays. So each petal is actually its own flower. Those petals kind of curl up and make a tube for insects to go in and do the pollination. So all this plant has many, many flowers on it. So another way you can tell the difference between fall sunflowers and sunflowers is how the flowers stand up. So these flowers stand pretty much on their own, flowers point straight up versus off to the side or nodding down. These flowers make a great border to your wildflower garden in your own backyard. So consider planting them. This is called cup plant. And what makes this plant unique is how the leaves kind of form together, together creating a cup that collects water. But there's no evidence that says the plant uses the water that's stored. We do notice that little insects crawl, get stuck in it, and can't come out. So it's possible that this is a way uh, to defend itself from insects trying to catch a free meal. I hope you found your new favorite plant in this segment at Hadley Valley. Now remember, you can't take anything out of the forest preserve. It's actually illegal. So I encourage you to find these native plants at native plant sales. The Forest Preserve hosts one every year in May. So mark your calendar so you too can have a prairie in your own backyard and make up for that 0.01% that we're trying to rebuild. And now a moment of zen. That was super peaceful, but now are you ready for a little chaos? Let's fly over to Plum Creek Nature Center to view the ruby-throated hummingbirds. Wow. 
we're here in the bird and butterfly sanctuary where we've planted our native plants and we hang feeders on every pole. Now in the winter, we hang tons of different seed feeders, but in the summer, we switch to hummingbird feeders. Our ruby-throated hummingbirds arrive here in May. They nest in June, continue feeding the babies until July, and by August, everyone's on their own and getting ready to migrate. The males leave first, starting their journey, and right now, the feeders are crazy busy with the babies ready to eat on their own and everyone fueling up for the big journey. Let's check out those feathers. You can see that they have shiny backs and the males have a little extra pop on their throats. The males show their red color when they're trying to impress the ladies or when they're defending their territory. And this color is not quite pigments, it's more a light trick. So when light reflects and refracts, we see that shiny emerald color. So this is just like if you looked into a prism or if you're looking at shiny bubbles. So now let's try to look at those wings. Can you even see them? They flap so fast that they turn blurry. Hummingbirds are pretty special because they can fly up, down, side to side, backwards, and even upside down. When they're hovering, if you were to slow down that motion, you could see that the wings can twist in a figure eight pattern. That's super cool. Now, how fast can you beat your wings per second? <sighs> Hummingbirds can beat 50 to 80 times per second. That's mind blowing. So that's why they're called hummingbirds because those wings beat so fast that it makes a humming or even a buzzing sound. How many times do you think your heart beats? Usually humans' hearts beat 60 to 100 times per minute while resting. When hummingbirds are at rest, their hearts are beating 250 times per minute. And when they're flying, that number goes up to 1200 times per minute. These hummingbirds have great eyes. They can see farther than humans and in a wider spectrum favoring the color red. They're really good at spotting their favorite flowers. It would just be like you on the highway spotting your favorite fast food restaurant to stop at. These hummingbirds also have great memories. So supposedly they can remember every flower they visit and your feeder. Plus they know how long it takes for that nectar to fill back up. Ruby throated hummingbirds are small birds. So that means they also have small nests. The female is responsible for making this nest. She stomps down on the bottom, she smooths it out with her body, and she makes it with soft down from thistles or dandelions. Then to tie it all together, she'll take silk from spider webs. So sometimes you'll see hummingbirds going into every crack in the window trying to find something to tie it all together. Then the final piece is to add lichen and moss to camouflage it in the leaves. This can take six to 10 days to complete a nest. Now the colors are a little duller on this nest. It's one of our education pieces. So we use it in exhibits, we use it for programs, just so you can see up close what a hummingbird nest really looks like. Females lay a clutch size of one to three eggs, and these eggs are sizes of jelly beans. How cute! These chicks stay in the nest for like two to three weeks before fledging and they're on their own. When they're old enough to leave the nest, they're about the same size as the adults. So if you think you see a baby hummingbird in your yard, chances are that's actually a hummingbird moth that looks and acts like a hummingbird, but is much smaller in size. A ruby-throated hummingbird weighs about two to four grams. So it equals out to one penny for the males and two pennies for the females. They also have to eat their weight every day. So this includes the nectar from flowers, our sugar water from the feeders, and they even sneak in some insects for an extra boost of protein. Plum Creek Nature Center participates in hummingbird banding once a year in August. We collect the information from these bands to see where they migrate and how long they live. So we collect the birds, weigh them, measure them, and put on a tiny little bracelet. If they already have a band, then we can record that data and update the database. That's the only way we can track where these birds go is if they have these bands and they've been previously caught. For example, last year we caught a bird that had a ban and we could figure out that that bird was five years old. That's really important because hummingbirds only live three to five. So if that individual gets caught again, it'd be really exciting to see where it's at now. These ruby-throated hummingbirds are going to be overwintering in Central America. So that includes a 500 mile journey across the Gulf of Mexico, which they fly solo in one day. All right, are you ready to get these hummingbirds into your backyard? There's a few things you can do. Step one is plant some native plants. There's lots of varieties, lots of different plants that the hummingbirds love. You can look for red colors like our cardinal flower, but they also like 
uh, purple comb flower, ironweed, trumpet creeper, jewelweed. There's so many options. So for quicker results, you can try a hummingbird feeder. Now your hummingbird feeder can be red, but no need for red dyes in the water. We recommend one cup of sugar to four cups of water. You can blend it in with really warm water or even start a pot of boiling water and put the sugar in. You really just want to dissolve the sugar into a nice mixture. The key to your feeder is make sure it's clean. On hot sunny days, that sugar water can grow bacteria. So make sure you're cleaning and refilling your feeders on a regular basis. If the base is big enough, you may even get other visitors like Orioles or Downy Woodpeckers. We have a few baby Downy Woodpeckers that have been loving our feeders lately. These Woodpeckers are used to eating berries and nectar. So even though we're used to seeing them on trees and for insects, they have that same kind of tongue that can get in and drink up that water. The last tip I have for you is add a lot of feeders. These ruby-throated hummingbirds are not very good sharers and they defend their feeder very passionately. So you can see here at Plum Creek Nature Center, we have plenty of feeders for them to share. You can put them in different places around your yard so they have plenty of space to have their own corners. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Buzz, where we learn about the bats, the birds, and the plants of Will County's forest preserves. Now it's your turn. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org for information about the preserves and our upcoming virtual programs. I'll see you next time on The Buzz.